Chapter Eight of the Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, the Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, the Man Who Lost His Shadow by Adelbert von Chamiso, translated by Frederick Henry Hedge. Chapter 8 A pedestrian soon joined me, who begged, after he had walked for some time by the side of my horse, that, as we went the same way, he might be allowed to lay a cloak, which he carried, on the steed behind me. I permitted it in silence. He thanked me with easy politeness for the trifling service praised my horse, and thence took occasion to extol the happiness and power of the rich, and let himself, I know not how, fall into a kind of monologue, in which he had me now merely for a listener. He unfolded his views of life and of the world, and came very soon upon metaphysics, in which the ultimate pretension extended to the discovery of the word that should solve all mysteries. He stated his premises with great clearness, and proceeded to the proofs. Thou knowest, my friend, that I have clearly discovered, since I have run through the schools of the philosophers, that I have by no means a turn for philosophical speculations, and that I have totally renounced for myself this field. Since then I have left many things to themselves, abandoned the desire to know and to comprehend many things and, as thou thyself didst advise me, have, trusting to my common sense, followed as far as I was able the voice within me on the direct course. Now this rhetorician seemed to me to raise, with great talent, a firmly put-together fabric, which was at once self-based and self-supported, and stood as by an innate necessity. I missed, however, in it completely what most of all I was desirous to find, and so it became for me merely a work of art, whose ornamental compactness and completeness served only to charm the eye. Nevertheless I listened willingly to the eloquent man, who drew my attention from my grief to him, and I would have gladly yielded myself wholly up to him had he captivated my heart as well as my understanding. Meanwhile the time had passed, and, unobserved, the dawn had already enlightened the heaven. I was horrified as I looked suddenly up and saw the pomp of colors unfold itself in the east, which announced the approach of the sun. While at this hour, in which the shadows ostentatiously display themselves in their greatest extent, there was no protection from it, no refuge in the open country to be descried and I was not alone. I cast a glance at my companion, and was again terror-struck. It was no other than the man in the grey coat. He smiled at my alarm, and went on without allowing me to get in a word. Let, however, as is the way of the world, our mutual advantage for a while unite us. It is all in good time for separating." The road here along the mountain range, though you have not yet thought of it, is nevertheless the only one into which you could prudently have struck. Down into the valley you may not venture, and still less will you desire to return again over the heights whence you are come. And this is also exactly my way. I see that you already turn pale before the rising sun. I will, for the time we keep company, lend you your shadow and you, on that account, tolerate me in your society. You have no longer your bindle with you. I will do you good service. You do not like me, and I am sorry for it. But, notwithstanding, you can make use of me. The devil is not so black as he is painted. Yesterday you vexed me, it is true. I will not upbraid you with it today. And I have already shortened the way hither for you, that you must allow. Only just take your shadow again a while on trail. The sun had ascended. 
people appeared on the road. I accepted, though with internal repugnance, the proposal. Smiling, he let my shadow glide to the ground, which immediately took its place on that of the horse, and trotted gaily by my side. I was in the strangest state of mind. I rode past a group of country people, who made way for a man of consequence reverently and with bared heads. I rode on and gazed with greedy eyes and a palpitating heart on this my quondam shadow, which I had now borrowed from a stranger, yes, from an enemy. The man went carelessly near me, and even whistled a tune, he on foot, I on horseback. A dizziness seized me. The temptation was too great. I suddenly turned the reins, clapped spurs to the horse, and struck at full speed into a side path. But I carried not off the shadow, which, at the turning, glided from the horse and awaited its lawful possessor on the high road. I was compelled with shame to turn back. The man in the gray coat, when he had calmly finished his tune, laughed at me, set the shadow right again for me, and informed me it would then only hang fast and remain with me when I was disposed to become the rightful proprietor. I hold you, continued he, fast by the shadow, and you cannot escape me. A rich man like you needs shadow. It cannot be otherwise. And you only are to blame that you did not perceive that sooner. I continued my journey on the same road. The comforts and the splendor of life again surrounded me. I could move about freely and conveniently, since I possessed a shadow, although only a borrowed one, and I everywhere inspired the respect which riches command. But I carried death in my heart. My strange companion, who gave himself out as the unworthy servant of the richest man in the world, possessed an extraordinary professional readiness prompt and clever beyond comparison, the very model of a valet for a rich man. But he stirred not from my side, perpetually directing the conversation towards me, and continually blabbing out the most confidential matters, so that at length, were it only to be rid of him, I resolved to settle the affair of the shadow. He was become as burdensome to me as he was hateful. I was even in fear of him, he had made me dependent on him. He held me, after he had conducted me, back into the glory of the world which I had fled from. I was obliged to tolerate his eloquence upon myself, and felt, in fact, that he was in the right. A rich man in the world must have a shadow, and so soon as I desired to command the rank which he had contrived again to make necessary to me, I saw but one issue. By this, however, I stood fast. After having sacrificed my love, after my life had been blighted, I would never sign away my soul to this creature for all the shadows in the world. I knew not how it would end. We sat one day before a cave which the strangers who frequent these mountains are accustomed to visit. We heard there the rush of subterranean streams roaring up from immeasurable depths and the stone cast in seemed, in its resounding fall, to find no bottom. He painted to me, as he often did, with a vivid power of imagination and in the lustrous charms of the most brilliant colors, the most carefully finished pictures of what I might achieve in the world by virtue of my purse, if I had but once my shadow in my possession. With my elbows rested on my knees, I kept my face concealed in my hands, and listened to the false one, my heart divided between the seduction and my own strong will. In such an inward conflict I could no longer contain myself, and the deciding strife began. You appear, sir, to forget that I have indeed allowed you, upon certain conditions, to remain in my company, but that I have reserved my perfect freedom. If you command it, I pack up. He was accustomed to menace. I was silent. He began immediately to roll up my shadow. I turned pale, but I let him proceed. There followed a long pause. He first broke it. You cannot bear me, sir. You hate me. 
I know it. Yet why do you hate me? Is it because you attacked me on the highway, and sought to deprive me by violence of my bird's nest? Or is it because you have endeavored in a thievish manner to cheat me out of my property, the shadow, which was entrusted to you entirely on your honor? I, for my part, do not, therefore, hate you. I find it quite natural that you should seek to avail yourself of all your advantages, cunning, and power. For the rest, that you have the very strictest principles, that you have a taste which you think is like honor itself, against this I have nothing to say. In fact, I think not so strictly as you. I merely act as you think. Or have I at any time pressed my finger on your throat in order to bring to me your most precious soul, for which I have a fancy? Have I, on account of my bartered purse, let a servant loose on you? Have I sought thus to swindle you out of it? I had nothing to oppose to this, and he proceeded. Very good, sir, very good. You cannot endure me. I know that very well, and am by no means angry with you for it. We must part. That is clear. And, in fact, you begin to be very wearisome to me. In order, then, to rid you of my further shame-inspiring presence, I once more counsel you to purchase this thing from me. I extended to him the purse. At that price? No. I sighed deeply and added, Be it so, then. I insist, sir, that we part and that you no longer obstruct my path in a world which it is to be hoped has room enough in it for us both. He smiled and replied, I go, sir, but first let me instruct you how you may ring for me when you desire to see again your most devoted servant. You have only to shake your purse so that the eternal gold pieces therein jingle, and the sound will instantly attract me. Everyone thinks of his own advantage in this world. You see that I, at the same time, am thoughtful of yours, since I reveal to you a new power. Oh, this purse. Had the moths already devoured your shadow, that would still constitute a strong bond between us. Enough. You have me in my gold. Should you have any commands, even when far off, for your servant, you know that I can show myself very active in the service of my friends, and the rich stand particularly well with me. You have seen it yourself. Only your shadow, sir, allow me to tell you that. Never again, except on one sole condition, is it yours. Forms of the pastime swept before my soul. I demanded hastily, Had you a signature from Mr. John? He smiled. With so good a friend, it was by no means necessary. Where is he? I will know it. He plunged, hesitatingly, his hand into his pocket, and, dragged thence by the hair, appeared Thomas John's ghastly, disfigured form, and the blue death lips moved themselves with heavy words. Justo judicio de judicatus sum. Justo judicio de condemnatus sum. I cried out with horror, dashing the purse into the abyss. I adjure thee, in the name of heaven, take thyself hence and never again show thyself in my sight. He arose gloomily and instantly vanished behind the masses of rock. End of chapter 8. Recording by James K. White. Chula Vista. Chapter 9 of The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley M. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow by Adelbert von Chamisso, translated by Frederick Henry Hedge. Chapter 9 I sat there without shadow and without money, but a heavy weight was taken from my bosom. I was calm. Had I lost my love, 
or had I in that loss felt myself free from blame, I believe that I should have been happy, but I knew not, however, what I should do. I examined my pockets. I found yet several gold pieces there. I counted them and laughed. I had my horses below at the inn. I was ashamed of returning thither. I must, at least, wait till the sun was gone down. It stood yet high in the heaven. I laid myself down in the shade of the nearest trees and fell calmly asleep. Lovely shapes blended themselves before me in charming dance into a pleasing dream. Mina with a flower wreath in her hair floated by me and smiled kindly upon me. The noble Bendel also was crowned with flowers and went past with a friendly greeting. I saw many besides, and I believed thee too, Chamiso, in the distant throng. A bright light appeared, but no one had a shadow, and what was stranger it had by no means a bad effect. Flowers and songs, love and joy, under groves of palm. I could neither hold fast nor single out the moving, lightly floating, lovable forms, but I knew that I dreamed such a dream with joy, and was careful to avoid waking. I was already awake, but still kept my eyes closed in order to retain the fading apparition longer before my soul. I finally opened my eyes. The sun stood still high in the heaven, but in the east. I had slept through the night. I took it for a sign that I should not return to the inn. I gave up readily as lost what I yet possessed there, and determined to strike on foot into a neighboring path, which led along the wood-grown foot of the mountains leaving it to fate to fulfill what had yet in store for me. I looked not behind me, and thought not even of applying to Bendel, whom I left rich behind me, and which I could readily have done. I considered the new character which I should support in the world. My dress was very modest. I had on an old black garment, which I had already worn in Berlin, and which, I know not how, had first come again into my hands for this journey. I had also a travelling cap on my head, a pair of old boots on my feet. I arose and cut me on the spot a knotty stick as a memorial, and advanced at once on my wandering. I met in the wood an old peasant who greeted me in a friendly manner, and with whom I entered into conversation. I inquired, like an inquisitive traveller, first the way, then about the country and its inhabitants, the productions of the mountains, and many such things. He answered my questions sensibly and loquaciously. We came to the bed of a mountain torrent, which had spread its devastations over a wide tract of the forest. I shuddered involuntarily at the sun-bright space, and allowed the countryman to go first, but in the midst of this dangerous spot he stood still and turned to relate to me the history of this desolation. He saw immediately my defect, and paused in the midst of his discourse. But how does that happen? The gentleman has actually no shadow. Alas, alas, replied I, sighing, during a long and severe illness my hair, nails, and shadow fell off. See, father, at my age, my hair, which is renewed again, is quite white, the nails very short, and the shadow, that will never grow again. Ay, ay, responded the old man, shaking his head, no shadow, that is bad. That was a bad illness that the gentleman had. But he continued not his narrative, and at the next crossway which presented itself he left me without saying a word. Bitter tears trembled anew upon my cheeks, and my cheerfulness was gone. I pursued my way with a sorrowful heart, and sought no further the society of men. I kept myself in the darkest wood, and was many a time compelled, in order to pass over a space where the sun shone, to wait for whole hours, lest some human eye should forbid me the transit. In the evening I sought for a small inn in the villages. I went particularly in quest of a mine in the mountains where I hoped to get work under the oath, since, besides that my present situation made it imperative that I should provide for my support, I had discovered that the most active labor alone could protect me from my own annihilating thoughts. A few rainy days advanced me well on the way, but at the expense of my boots, whose soles had been calculated for the Graf Peter and not for the pedestrian laborer. I was already barefoot. I must procure a pair of new boots. The next morning I transacted this business with much gravity in a village where was held a wake, and where in a booth old and new boots stood for sale. I selected and bargained long. 
I was forced to deny myself a new pair, which I would gladly have had, but the extravagant demand frightened me. I therefore contented myself with an old pair, which were yet good and strong, and which the handsome, blond-haired boy who kept the stall, for present cash payment handed to me with a friendly smile, and wished me good luck on my journey. I put them on at once, and left the place by the northern gate. I was sunk very deep in my thoughts, and scarcely saw where I set my feet, for I was pondering on the mine, which I hoped to reach by evening, and where I hardly knew how I should propose myself. I had not advanced two hundred strides when I observed that I had got out of the way. I therefore looked round me, and found myself in a wild and ancient forest where the axe appeared never to have been wielded. I pressed forward still a few steps, and beheld myself in the midst of desert rocks which were overgrown only with moss and lichens, and between which lay fields of snow and ice. The air was intensely cold. I looked round. The wood had vanished behind me. I took a few strides more and around me reigned the silence of death. The ice on which I stood extended itself boundlessly, and a thick, heavy fog rested on it. The sun stood blood-red on the edge of the horizon. The cold was insupportable. I knew not what had happened to me. The benumbing frost compelled me to hasten my steps. I heard alone the roar of distant waters. A step and I was on the ice margin of an ocean. Innumerable herds of seals plunged rushing before me in the flood. I pursued the shore. I saw naked rocks, land, birch and pine forests. I now advanced for a few minutes right onwards. It was stifling hot. I looked around. I stood amongst beautifully cultivated rice fields, and beneath mulberry trees. I seated myself in their shade. I looked at my watch. I had left the market town only a quarter of an hour before. I fancied that I dreamed. I bit my tongue to awake myself. I closed my eyes in order to collect my thoughts. I heard before me singular accents pronounced through the nose. I looked up. Two Chinese, unmistakable from their Asiatic form of countenance, if, indeed, I would have given no credit to their costume, addressed me in their speech with the accustomed salutations of their country. I arose and stepped two paces backward. I saw them no more. The landscape was totally changed. Trees and forests instead of rice fields. I contemplated these trees and the plants which bloomed around me, which I recognized as the growth of southeastern Asia. I wished to approach one of these trees. One step, and again all was changed. I marched now like a recruit who is drilled, and strode slowly and with measured steps. Wonderfully diversified lands, rivers, meadows, mountain chains, steps, deserts of sand, unrolled themselves before my astonished eyes. There was no doubt of it. I had seven leaked boots on my feet. End of chapter 9 Recording by Ashley M. Chapter 10 of The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley M. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow, by Adelbert von Chamiso, translated by Frederick Henry Hedge, Chapter 10. I fell in speechless adoration on my knees and shed tears of thankfulness, for suddenly stood my fortune clear before my soul. For early offense thrust out from the society of men, I was cast for compensation upon nature, which I ever loved. The earth was given me as a rich garden, study for the object and strength of my life, and science for its goal. It was no resolution which I adopted. I have since then, with severe, unremitted diligence, striven faithfully to represent what then stood clear and perfect before my eye, and my satisfaction has depended on the agreement of the demonstration with the original. I prepared without hesitation with a hasty survey, to take possession of the field which I should hereafter reap. I stood on the heights of the bet, and the sun, which had risen upon me only a few hours before, now already stooped to the evening sky. I wandered over Asia from east to west, overtaking him in his course, and entering Africa. I gazed about me with eager curiosity, as I repeatedly traversed it in all directions. As I surveyed the ancient pyramids and temples in passing through Egypt, I descried in the desert, not far from hundred-gated Thebes, 
the caves where the Christian anchorites once dwelt. It was suddenly firm and clear in me. Here is thy home. I selected one of the most concealed, which was at the same time spacious, convenient, and inaccessible to the jackals, for my future abode, and again went forward. I passed at the pillars of Hercules over to Europe, and when I had reviewed the southern and northern provinces, I crossed from northern Asia over the polar glaciers to Greenland and America, traversed both parts of that continent, and the winter which already reigned in the south drove me speedily back northwards from Cape Horn. I tarried a while till it was day in eastern Asia, and after some repose continued my wandering. I traced through both Americas the mountain chain which comprehends the highest known inequalities on our globe. I stalked slowly and cautiously from summit to summit, now over flaming volcanoes, now snow-crowned peaks, often breathing with difficulty. When reaching Mount Elias, I sprang across Bay Ring straight to Asia. I followed the western shores in their manifold windings, and examined with especial care which of the islands there located were accessible to me. From the peninsula of Malacca my boots carried me to Sumatra, Java, Bali, and Lombok. I attempted, often with dangerous and always in vain, a northwest passage over the lesser islets and rocks with which this sea is studded to Borneo and the other islands of this archipelago. I was compelled to abandon the hope. At length I seated myself on the extremest part of Lambok, and, gazing towards the south and east, wept as, as the fast-closed grating of my prison, that I had so soon discovered my limits. New Holland, so extraordinary, and so essentially necessary to the comprehension of the earth and its sun-woven garments, of the vegetable and the animal world, with the South Sea and its zoophyte islands, was interdicted in me, and thus, at the very outset, all that I should gather and build up was destined to remain a mere fragment. Oh, my Adelbert, what, after all, are the endeavors of men? Often did I, in the severest winter of the southern hemisphere, endeavor, passing the polar glaciers westward, to leave behind me those two hundred strides out from Cape Horn, which sundered me probably from Van Diemen's Land and New Holland, regardless of my return, or whether this dismal region should close upon me as my coffin lid, making desperate leaps from ice drift to ice drift, and bidding defiance to the cold and the sea. In vain I never reached New Holland, but every time I came back to Lambach, seated myself on its extremest peak, and wept again with my face turned towards the south and east, as at the fast-closed bars of my prison. I tore myself at length from this spot, and returned with a sorrowful heart into inner Asia. I traversed that farther, pursuing the morning dawn westward, and came yet in the night to my proposed home in the Thebais, which I had touched upon in the afternoon of the day before. As soon as I was somewhat rested, and when it was day again in Europe, I made it my first care to procure everything which I wanted. First of all, stop shoes, for I had experienced how inconvenient it was, when I wished to examine near objects, not to be able to slacken my stride except by pulling off my boots. A pair of slippers drawn over them had completely the effect which I anticipated, and later I always carried two pairs, since I sometimes threw them from my feet without having time to pick them up again, when lions, men, or hyenas startled me from my botanizing. My very excellent watch was, for the short duration of my passage, a capital chronometer. Besides this, I needed a sextant, some scientific instruments, and books. To procure all this, I made several anxious journeys to London and Paris, which, auspiciously for me, a mist just then overshadowed. As the remains of my enchanted gold was now exhausted, I easily accomplished the payments by gathering African ivory, in which, however, I was obliged to select only the smallest husks, as not too heavy for me. I was soon furnished and equipped with all these, and commenced immediately, as private philosopher, my new course of life. I roamed about the earth, now determining the altitudes of mountains, now the temperature of its springs and the air now contemplating the animal, now inquiring into the vegetable tribes. I hastened from the equator to the pole, from one world to the other, comparing facts with facts. The eggs of the African ostrich or the northern sea fowl, and fruits, especially of the tropical palms and bananas, were even my ordinary food. 
in lieu of happiness i had tobacco and of human society and the ties of love one faithful poodle which guarded my cave in the thebais and when i returned home with fresh treasures sprang joyfully towards me and gave me still a human feeling that i was not alone on the earth an adventure was yet destined to conduct me back amongst mankind End of chapter 10 Recording by Ashley M. Chapter 11 of The Wonderful History of Peter Slamil, The Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley M. The Wonderful History of Peter Slamil, The Man Who Lost His Shadow by Adelbert von Chamisso, translated by Frederick Henry Hedge. Chapter 11 As I once wore my boots on the shores of the north, and gathered lichens and seaweed, an ice bear came unawares upon me round the corner of a rock. Flinging off my slippers, I would step over to an opposite island, to which a naked crag which protruded midway from the waves offered me a passage. I stepped with one foot firmly on the rock, and plunged over on the other side into the sea, one of my slippers having unobserved remained fast on the foot. The excessive cold seized on me. I with difficulty rescued my life from this danger, and the moment I reached land I ran with the utmost speed to the Libyan deserts, in order to dry myself in the sun, but as I was here exposed, it burned me so furiously on the head that I staggered back again very ill towards the north. I sought to relieve myself by rapid motion, and ran with swift uncertain steps, from west to east, from east to west. I found myself now in the day, now in the night, now in summer, now in the winter's cold. I knew not how long I thus reeled about on the earth. A burning fever glowed in my veins. With deepest distress I felt my senses forsaking me. As mischief would have it, in my incautious career I now trod on someone's foot. I must have heard him. I received a heavy blow and fell to the ground. When I again returned to consciousness, I lay comfortably in a good bed which stood amongst many other beds in a handsome hall. Someone sat at my head. People went through the hall from one bed to another. They came to mine and spake together about me. They styled me number twelve, and on the wall at my feet stood. Yes, certainly it was no delusion. I could distinctly read on a black tablet of marble in great golden letters, quite correctly written, my name, Peter Schlemiel. On the tablet beneath my name, were two other rows of letters, but I was too weak to put them together. I again closed my eyes. I heard something, of which the subject was Peter Schlemiel, read aloud, and articulately, but I could not collect the sense. I saw a friendly man, and a very lovely woman in black dress, appear at my bedside. The forms were not strange to me, and yet I could not recognize them. Some time went over, and I recovered my strength. I was called number twelve, and number twelve on account of his long beard passed for a jew on which account however he was not at all the less carefully treated that he had no shadow appeared to have been unobserved my boots as i was assured were with all that i had brought hither in good keeping in order to be restored to me on my recovery the place in which i lay was called the schlemilium what was daily read aloud concerning Peter Slamil was an exhortation to pray for him as the founder and benefactor of this institution. The friendly man whom I had seen by my bed was Bendel. The lovely woman was Mina. I recovered unrecognized in the Schlemilium, and learned yet farther that I was in Bendel's native city, where, with the remains of my otherwise unblessed gold, he had in my name founded this hospital, where the unhappy blessed me, and himself maintained its superintendence. Mina was a widow. An unhappy criminal process had cost Mr. Rascal his life, and her the greater part of her property. Her parents were no more. She lived here as a pious widow, and practiced works of mercy. Once she conversed with Mr. Bendel at the bedside of number twelve. Why, noble lady, will you so often expose yourself to the bad atmosphere which prevails here? Does fates, then, deal so hardly with you that you wish to die? No, Mr. Bendel, since I have dreamed out my long dream, and have awakened it myself, all is well with me. Since then, I crave not, and fear not, death. Since then, I reflect calmly on the past and the future. Is it not also with a still and inward happiness that you now, in so devout a manner, serve your master and friend? Thank God, yes, noble lady. 
but we have seen wonderful things we have unwarily drunk much good and bitter woes out of the full cup now it is empty and we may believe that the whole has been only a trial and armed with the wisest concernment await the real beginning the real beginning is of another fashion and we wish not back the first jugglery and round the whole glad such as it was to have lived through it i feel also within me a confidence that i must now be better than formerly with our old friend in me too replied the lovely widow and then passed on the conversation left a deep impression upon me but i was undecided in myself whether i should make myself known or depart hence unrecognized i took my resolve i requested paper and pencil and wrote these words it is indeed better with your old friend now than formerly and if he does penance it is the penance of reconciliation hereupon i desired to dress myself as i found myself stronger the key of the small wardrobe which stood near my bed was brought and i found therein all that belonged to me i put on my clothes suspended my botanical case in which i rejoiced still to find my northern lichens round my black garment drew on my boots laid the written paper on my bed and as the door opened i was already far on the way to the base as i took the way along the syrian coast on which i for the last time had wandered from home i perceived my poor figaro coming towards me this excellent poodle who had long expected his master at home seemed to desire to trace him out i stood still and called to him he sprang barking towards me with a thousand moving assurances of his inmost and most extravagant joy i took him up under my arm for in truth he could not follow me and brought him with me home again i found all in its old order and returned gradually as my strength was recruited to my former employment and mode of life except that i kept myself for a whole year out of the to me wholly insupportable polar cold and thus my dear tamaso i live to this day my boots are no worse for the wear as that very learned work of the celebrated theseus de rebus gestis Polticelli, at first led me to fear their force remains unimpaired my strength only decays yet i have the comfort to have exerted in a continuous and not fruitless pursuit of one object i have so far as my boots could carry me become more fundamentally acquainted than any man before me with the earth its shape its elevations its temperatures the changes of its atmosphere the exhibitions of its magnetic power and the life upon it especially in the vegetable world the facts i have recorded with the greatest possible exactness and in perspicuous order in several works and stated my deductions and views briefly in several treatises i have settled the geography of the interior of africa and of the northern polar regions of the interior of asia and its eastern shores my historia stirpium planetarium utrius orbis stands as a great fragment of the flora universalis terrae and as a branch of my systema naturae i believe that i have therein not merely augmented ad moderate calculation the amount of known species more than one-third but i have done something for the natural system and for the geography of plants i shall labor diligently at my fauna i shall take care of that before my death my work shall be deposited in the berlin university and thee my dear chamiso have i selected as the preserver of my singular history which perhaps when i have vanished from the earth may afford valuable instruction to many of its inhabitants but thou my friend if thou wilt live among men learn before all things to reverence the shadow and then the gold wishest thou to live only for thyself and for thy better self oh then thou needest no counsel thoughtful readers of this remarkable story will be pleased no doubt to have the hidden significance of it its latent lessons set before them in statements more explicit and distinct than have yet been made the whole meaning of the narrative is summed up by its author in the sly and semi-satirical exhortation with which he closes my friend while you live among mankind learn above all things first to reverence your shadow then next your money to elucidate the full force of this somewhat obscure and metaphorical sentence and raise into clear relief the genuine moral teachings of the narrative we shall have to subdivide our explanation and present its contents under three heads first which is more important to the prosperity and happiness of a man the real character he is or the reputation he bears the substance of his personal being or the shadow he casts in society there are two answers in the intrinsic world of god consciousness and destiny the former is incomparably the more momentous but in the conventional world of civilization the latter is often considered 
and thus apparently made the essential thing second in the influence exerted on our experience respectively by money and by the goods that money represents which is superior which of these should hold the primary which the secondary rank in our esteem here likewise there are two opposed answers true insight unhesitatingly affirms that money is merely a symbol while the goods of life food clothing shelter education social intercourse are the reality it symbolizes given a full supply of the goods of life and money is needless on the contrary no amount of money would be worth anything if unrelated with the goods of life without which we cannot get along at all therefore what immediately supports life is the real substance and this emblematic token is only a shadow that is the first answer to our question but a quite different answer passes current in the ordinary course of the world for under the present system of civilization money commands purchases and distributes the goods of life in this way it becomes the imperious lord of the supplies for our wants and consequently outranks them all in importance in fashionable circles a man gifted with magnificent genius and nobility but destitute of money passes for nothing while a commonplace lubber with a million guineas in the bank is a king the costly substance of the former is neglected because he has no pecuniary shadow the rich pecuniary shadow of the latter is worshipped notwithstanding his unsubstantial worthlessness the meaning of the sign has disappeared in the formal hollowness of the signal the substance and the shadow have changed places third the last and deepest lesson tacitly taught by the mysterious adventures of peter schlemiel is the delightful absurdity the ridiculous logical incoherence involved in the supposition that a negative abstraction can exist by itself and operate independently of everything else there are very few things in literature more delicious in their ironical wit and humour than the coolness with which the author assumes that the shadow of a man is something quite free of any dependence on him who throws it the perfect innocence with which poor peter describes his shadow as a material object which could be picked up and folded together and put in the pocket or which could be frozen to the ground and left there while its owner walked away it is a cutting satire on that agnostic philosophy which personifies mental abstractions and then substitutes them for the causal personality from which alone mental abstractions can be derived in this manner personality is pulverized into a series of states of consciousness with no permanent identity threading them so in the darwinian theory of the origin of species an arbitrary personification of the verbal phrase natural selection is made to work as an intelligent cause to produce all the phenomena of evolution and to supersede god by doing his work in his place natural selection is not a causative entity it is the abstract expression for a process which is the resultant of the various cooperative factors involved in the whole systematic relationship of being philosophy can no more solve the problem of evolution without the three concepts creator creation creatures than one can account for the appearance of a human shadow without presupposing the three facts a man a light and the interception of the light by the body of the man the shadow of nature implies the light of god w r alger end of the wonderful history of peter schlemiel the man who lost his shadow by adelbert von chamisso translated by frederick henry hedge recording by ashley m